Before we get into the video, be sure to subscribe with notifications on. The majority of you guys watching these videos aren't actually subscribed, according to my analytics. So what are you waiting for? Subscribe to the channel for TNA and wrestling coverage. What's going on guys, it's Tom here and welcome back to another video on the channel. Today we're going to be counting down the top 5 worst slash funniest slash most infamous TNA botches of all time. Now, obviously TNA has had a lot of botches and mishaps and bloopers and whatnot, so I'm probably missing out a lot, but these are just my personal 5, so let me know in the comments what you think the worst or funniest or whatever TNA botches of all time are. Let me know in the comments and let's get right into the video, shall we? Coming in at number 5, we have just the entirety of Jenna Morales versus Charmel. I didn't want to put this at number one because myself and the rest of TNA's fan base have spoken about this to death and if you're watching this video you most likely know about this match. So I put it at number five just to get it out of the way really. I have an entire video on my channel talking about this match and everything wrong with it, you can check it out, but allow me to summarize here. Jenna Maraska is not a wrestler. She is a former Survivor contestant and was only bought in by TNA because they were desperate for any mainstream crossover. Jenna Maraska was a heel and was the financial backer to the main event Mafia. She began feuding with Charmel, who is also not a wrestler. Charmel is a manager and while she had wrestled a couple times in TNA, she had only ever been involved in tag matches with Booker T where she is protected and had limited involvement in the matches. So, her wrestling a singles match on one of TNA's biggest pay-per-views of the year within Victory Road 2009 with another non-wrestler was an absolute recipe for disaster. And it was an absolute disaster. The entire match was full of botches and was sloppy as hell and just painful to watch, even to the point where even Jenna Maraska's entrance was bad. They did some awful slaps, awful selling, they did that catfight spot where they roll over the referee and just nobody cared at all. The match was famously given minus 5 stars by Brian Alvarez who also labelled it as the worst women's wrestling match he's ever seen, to which I agree. This is easily the single worst TNA match of all time and it was part of Victory Road 2009, which in itself was an awful pay-per-view. I mean, it was probably harder for them to have the worst match on the show than it was to have the best match on the show, just based on how bad the other matches were. Like, it was really bad, and they somehow managed to make it an even worse pay-per-view. I have a whole video where I review that pay-per-view as well. Check it out, link in the description, maybe, if I forget, which I probably will. Number 4, the Austin Aries and Christy Hemi incident. Now this botch wasn't even that bad of a botch, but it's what the botch would cause and what would come after it that would make it live in infamy in TNA history. On the May 9th episode of TNA Impact, Austin Aries and Bobby Roode were entering for a tag match against Bad Influence aka Christopher Daniels and Kazarian. Longtime announcer Christy Hemi was announcing the match and she accidentally announced Roode and Aries as Bad Influence, so that itself was the botch. Moving on. No, I'm kidding of course, it's everything that happened after this that turned this botch into a disaster. In order to kind of turn the botch into a positive and good situation in character, Ares in his heel character got Christy to re-announce them correctly, but while doing this got up in Christy's face, backed her into the corner and climbed to the middle turnbuckle, effectively putting his crotch in her face. Christy Hemi felt very uncomfortable by this and Aries was fined and suspended by TNA and a lot of negative press was held against TNA because of it. In an interview with Chris Van Vliet, Austin Aries says that he was just trying to be a heel and never intended on making Christy uncomfortable, nor did he think about the whole aspect of his crotch being in her face. He just climbed to the middle turnbuckle to taunt to the crowd and he also mentioned that him and Christy did patch things up soon after the incident, but either way, this moment goes down in TNA infamy, such a, such a small tiny botch turned into a public relations SHIT storm for TNA. Number 3, Daphne is injured by Rosie Lotterlove. 
Rosie Lotolove was a female wrestler who wrestled briefly for TNA in 2010. She trained at the Team 3D Wrestling Academy from 2007, and before coming to TNA, she wrestled for promotions such as WXW and Wrestlelicious, wrestling the likes of Mercedes Martinez and Tamina. And in 2010, she received a tryout match with TNA, which went horribly wrong. You see, despite having wrestled for three years, at this time, Rosie was still not that great in the ring and nowhere near ready for a global platform such as TNA. On April 20th, 2010, she wrestled a tryout dark match against Daphne in which she botched and injured Daphne after botching like a sit out kind of ass splash move, whatever, on her. She hit the stiffest splash on Daphne who ended up with a deeply bruised sternum, a severe stinger, which is a neurological injury which can possibly have permanent effect, and a concussion. All from one damn move, and Daphne still finished the match. Big ups Daphne. Ironically, this took place on 420, and TNA management had to have been smoking something because on May 12th, she was officially signed to TNA despite this awful tryout match. She would only ever wrestle two matches for the company and would depart just three months later and Daphne would return from the injury a month later on May 26, 2010 and would stay until TNA until March 2011 before departing the company. However, we're not done yet. After Daphne left TNA, she would file a lawsuit against the company for putting her in an unsafe working environment in regards to her match with Rosie. The suit was settled out of court on March 8, 2013. Since this, Daphne has retired from pro wrestling and Rosie too would retire in 2012, but she would actually come out of retirement in 2014 looking a lot slimmer, actually losing 127 pounds and she was damn good in the ring, so fair enough to her. She would sign for WWE in 2017 and wrestle under the name Sage Beckett and even competed in the Mae Young Classic, but she was released a year later. I mean, she would even make a one-time TNA appearance in 2015, losing to Awesome Kong at one night only event. Number 2. Homicide Can't Escape the Cage At Bound for Glory 2008, the Steel Asylum Cage was debuted. A big, red, ugly structure that was really difficult to escape. We'll get on to that. The first problem with the cage is that you can barely see inside it in the first place when it's on the hard cam. I mean, I can't imagine how bad it is for the live crowd to see the match, because you just can't see a thing. The infamy from this match comes from the January 4th, 2010 episode of Impact, a special 3 hour Monday episode of Impact that was used as a testing ground to see if TNA could move to Monday nights and was an episode with the intention of leading TNA into a new era. The Steel Asylum match featured Alex Shelley, Chris Sabin, Consequences Creed, Homicide, Jay Lethal, Kiyoshi, Suicide, and Amazing Red, and the match ended in a no contest after four and a half minutes when Homicide brought a weapon in. Yes, that's right, a cage match ended in a no contest. Seth Rollins and Bray Wyatt, you have a twin brother. After the match, Homicide attempted to escape the cage after beating down everyone, probably for some sort of symbolism for him being on top of everyone and being the top guy and being the true winner of the match. But Homicide couldn't get out. You see, you hear what I said about the cage being really hard to escape? That's because the cage was curved at the top, meaning effectively you had to Spider-Man your way out of it, and this made it very difficult for wrestlers to get out, in particular, Homicide. Homicide struggled for a good minute to get out of the cage, and eventually the wrestlers in the cage just had to stop selling and then started climbing the cage to, I don't know, hit him down or something, which was probably not scripted and probably got called in the ring, but they didn't even get to reach him because Homicide lost grip and fell all the way down in what looked like an awful bump to take. And then afterwards, Jeff Hardy just came out, which, you know, his TNA return was an awesome moment, but even that hasn't made me or anyone else forget about this hilarious moment where Homicide couldn't get out the cage. And coming in at number one, the removal of the six-sided ring and how everyone hated it. At Genesis 2010, Hulk Hogan made his first major change to TNA, and that was the removal of the six-sided ring, and oh boy oh boy was this segment botched. 
This did not get the intended reaction they wanted. For the opening segment, Hogan and Bischoff came out and reintroduced the four-sided ring back to TNA, to which the fans booed and were just pissed. They chanted, we want six sides, which led to Hogan calling the six-sided ring a playpen ring and that this four-sided ring is a real wrestling ring, which the fans just booed even further. And he then tried to give an inspirational speech on change and this just got booed as well. I've said this before, but to me, the removal of the six-sided ring was the removal of TNA's identity. I thought it was a terrible move and made TNA just look like every other wrestling company. And this was clearly not the reaction that Hogan wanted or that TNA were intending to get because fans were very much against this change and just three years later, the six-sided ring was brought back. Anyway, that's it for this video. Before we do end, I'm going to give a quick update to this channel regarding all the coronavirus stuff going on. Basically, um, if you don't know, I lived in Dubai uh, in 18 years, my entire life I lived there, until September when I moved to university in the UK. And obviously since uh, uni university started in September, I've been living in the UK. But because of this coronavirus stuff, my uni has been cancelled for the rest of the year and I have flown back to Dubai to be with my family, which means I have a lot of free time to make videos. And I know many people are self-isolating and are quarantined at home. So I'm gonna make it my goal to try and upload as much as possible to keep everyone entertained in this scary time and this time of uncertainty. Uh, so yeah, that's all. That's pretty much an update on this coronavirus stuff happening. But yeah, um, thanks for watching this video, guys. If you did enjoy, smack the like button. Subscribe with notifications on. Leave a comment down below. Share it with your friends. Subscribe to my second channel. Link in the description. Follow me on Twitter at Top 10 Wrestling. My Instagram is at I'm Tom Bell. I'll see you all soon. Goodbye and keep on rolling.